Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's normal to have a microphone. It's quite unusual to have a camera. So, <laughs> is this taking me all the time, Paul, or is it just once? It's going to take you the whole right. time. Okay, that's all right. That's fine. No, don't worry. I shall have to get used to it. Um, I hope you can hear me at the back. Am I, am I audible? Just about? Right, I'll do my best. Um, I feel obliged this morning to talk about the parable of the prodigal son. I know it's terribly familiar, but um, it is a rather splendid story, and it is, uh, along with the parable of the Good Samaritan, probably the best known of all the parables. The background to it, as far as the, the kind of customs are concerned, are apparently that in, in the time of Jesus it was normal for a father to apportion his property to his children during his lifetime, but what he apportioned would only be actually received upon his death. So in other words, the, the contents of the will were known in advance what it effectively means. Now, when we come to <coughs> try to understand the parable and, and apply it, I think we can look at it at two or three different levels, um, in other words, in two or three different frameworks. The obvious one, the one that, that we need to look at first, is the context of what's happening in, in Luke 14 and 15. The um, the occasion for the parable is really what you find in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15 where <coughs> Jesus is clearly receiving and actually um, sharing a meal with Pharisee, uh, with, with um, tax collectors and sinners as they're called and the Pharisees and scribes find this to be quite inappropriate that he should receive sinners and eat with them. So that provides the, the, the immediate context, and it's not difficult to see how the um, figures in the story relate to that context. Um, the younger son is clearly one of those who um, the Pharisees and scribes regard as the, the sinners. Uh, the story suggests that... Um, this man has, this, the, the sinner then, has taken what his father, what God gives to him and treats his father though, as though he's already died because he wants his money now and apparently receives it. And he then cuts loose from father and goes off to enjoy the freedom away from home and enjoying the things that his father has given him. So, <clears throat> this is an act of rebellion. This is um, the preference to enjoy his father's money, but not his father. And he wants independence and autonomy. It's, of course, the essence of human sin that we, we do that, that we wish to be um, freed from the irritating um, tutelage of, of, of God and to be able to do it, do as we think. And this proves, of course, as the story tells us, to be um, a foolish course. He wastes his inheritance and then finds himself in a desperate plight. Um, he has to hand himself over to strangers, and if you think about the context, this would mean that he, a Jew, has probably become the servant of Gentiles. And that would account for the fact that he has contact with that most abhorred of animals among Jews, the pigs. And he finds himself in a condition of hunger. Now, <coughs> I think we ought to um, understand the hunger, not simply in terms of physical hunger, and his plight not simply in terms of, of loss of all his money. What's being depicted here is a condition in which one is poor and in need, despite perhaps being rich. Um, a few years ago I, I read a review in the um, newspaper about one Paul Raymond, whose name might still be known to you. He was famous for the founding of some rather sleazy 
review bar in London and, and the associated magazines and he appears to have accumulated a vast wealth, I mean not surprisingly. <coughs> and the review said of him, uh, the, the obituary said of him that um, in fact his life was poor. He had a poor social life, a poor family life. He fell out with his son, his daughter died of drugs, he had no hobbies and the obituary finally said he was, I quote, ill-equipped to enjoy or constructively employ such wealth, so rich and yet profoundly poor. And that's the condition really of this, of this man. He's taken wealth, but finds himself poor. The one thing about the younger son, though, is that um, unlike the, the lost sheep or the lost coin in the preceding two parables, he is able to contribute to his own restoration <coughs> and his contribution is simply to reflect upon his plight and to realize the, the folly of the course that he's followed and the most positive thing about him is that he knows where to go in that situation he begins to realize what he has lost and says, I will go back to my father. And he goes, expecting to be treated, as you know, as one of the father's um, hired servants. So that, that story in itself is, is fairly clear, and, it, and we can see how it relates pretty obviously to the, um, the tax collectors and sinners at the beginning of the chapter. And it's equally clear, I think, how the um, elder son can be related to the Pharisees and the teachers. The, um, the story as a whole <coughs> in its final verse includes a kind of rebuke to the elder son for his attitude remember um, the father's words are, are loving but they are reproving at the same time at the end of the chapter and he is reproved um, because of his sense that he has suffered injustice from his father that his father has not treated him as well as he treated this renegade son. And he has a sense of jealousy. You, you feel almost he, he envies the younger son, the, um, the good time he's had for a little while, whereas he's never had a good time. And he has a very uncharitable description of his, of his brother's career, remember, um, whom he describes as this son of yours, as if he's got nothing to do with him. And he says of him that he has devoured your property with prostitutes. Well, we don't know that. That's his assumption. I mean, he may well be right, but... But the most important thing about the younger son, the, the really key thing, I think, is, is verse 29. When he says to his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a younger kid that I might celebrate with my friends. And as has often been pointed out, his idea of a celebration, his idea of fun, is to get away from father as well, to be with his friends. In other words, he has no more pleasure in his role as dutiful son with father than the younger son had. The younger son broke out. This, this man, although remaining at home, has inwardly been distant. And it's interesting that in verse 29, the word where it says um, served is actually the word that relates to the word slave. I have served you like a slave is what it is implying. Not like a son, not even like a hired servant, but like a slave. So he's been as far away really as his brother has been. In fact, neither of these two brothers has sought or shared in the, the joy and the company of their father. And so this elder son really is in much, as much need of repentance as is the younger. The difference is that um, he's not aware that he has that need. And the result is that um, both are welcomed by the father at the end of the story, but the the younger son is welcomed without rebuke because he has rebuked himself 
whereas the eldest son is rebuked because he is he has as yet failed to realize the situation but it's easy to think that these two sons then are the two key figures in the story but it's quite I think if one thinks about it the, the really important figure in the story is the father and what this parable is, is I think centrally asking is what kind of relationship with the father what kind of service do they do, do these sons do for him is it freedom or is it slavery the, the younger son has regarded father's service as something to be escaped from and realized, realized eventually that, that any other form of service away from his father that is the true slavery whereas the, the elder son has continued to see that service as slavery and, and in the end it's, it's true, a true relationship to the father that is at the heart of the story and the father is revealed as one a figure of, of unending compassion and forgiveness and understanding but neither of these sons has really understood him He's un he surpasses the expectations of the younger son and he shocks the elder son by his generosity and the, the, um, perhaps the most important lines come as you might expect at the end of the story look at what the um, father says to his Ill elder son verse 31 son you are always with me and all that is mine is yours now what that's saying is that um, this father regards both of these two both errant in different ways as still his sons both of them are wanted both of them are welcomed and he's telling them that the true riches are to be his son and to be with him you are always with me and then he adds these words all that is mine is yours now you I don't know whether you'll recognize the similarity I've probably said this before here but anyway um, remember John 17 verse 10 where <clears throat> Jesus says to his father all mine this is my version here all mine are yours and yours are mine in actual fact in the Greek that is identical to the words here of verse 31 all that is mine is yours so here you have a son a, a father who wishes to share everything that he possesses with his children and he wants them to recognize and appreciate all that is his because it is his because it comes from him and because it will be shared with him that is the condition that the father wants he doesn't want hired hands he doesn't want slaves he wants sons, daughters, children who wish to be with him and who enjoy what he alone is able to give and enjoy it because it is his well now you can it's, it's fairly obvious I think how that story relates to the immediate context of the um, of the chapter this, this um, criticism of Jesus by the Pharisees and scribes but I think we can put it into a larger context as well if you go back into chapter 14 of Luke you have the parable of the great banquet and remember this is the story about the, the invitation by, the, by this great man to a banquet and he, his invited guest and, and the feast of course is a familiar figure in the gospels for, the, um, for God's riches and in particular for the riches of his kingdom to which he has invited people but these, are, these people have got more pressing things that, that come first, come before them so what does the, the, um, the, 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 this man do? Well, in verse um, where will be 21, he says, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Now I think the way we, ought to, we, we perhaps ought to see this is that those who are invited 
but who are making excuses are the, the right thinking among Israel these are the, effectively the scribes and Pharisees, the righteous and then this list in verse 21, the poor and crippled and blind and lame, are probably precisely those sinners and tax collectors and the like still though, you notice, within the city, within Israel but then in verse um, 23 the master says to his servant go out to the highways and hedges in other words go out outside the city and that probably is talking about the gospel going out beyond the confines of Israel to Gentiles and when you think about this parable of the prodigal son in the context of the, the calling of Gentiles you can see how well the um, the roles fit the, <clears throat> the attitudes of the um, the elder son are pre almost precisely mirrored in the way you find in the later part of the New Testament Israel responded to the preaching of the gospel to Gentiles um, if you, in Acts you'll find repeatedly that um, Paul's preaching is hampered by jealousy of the Jews. It, it actually calls it jealous, for example, in, in Antioch of Pisidia, <coughs> in chapters um, 13, and again in um, Berea in chapter 17, and, and again in chapter 21 when Paul gets back to Jerusalem. There is jealousy over the calling of these unrighteous Gentiles, exactly as in the parable. You also have the disparagement of Gentiles in the same way that the elder son um, disparages his um, younger brother um, I don't want to talk about Romans this morning really but the um, first chapter of Romans contains that, that lengthy description of Gentile sins as seen through the eyes of, of Jews all the terrible things that they do, they do. and then in the, the following chapter of Romans um, you have Paul turning the table on, on um, Jewish readers by pointing out that they are in fact are no better than Gentiles which is what of course is, is true in the parable as well that the elder son is really no better than the younger and the issue of slavish service is of course one that's very prominent in Paul's letters um, prominent in Romans 7 where he describes being under the bondage of the law or Galatians 4 where he talks about um, Jerusalem that is now is in bondage and so on in fact what this parable gives us is a model, a picture of God's atonement his offer of, of um, reconciliation and redemption to all mankind to Jews and Gentiles alike and I'm struck I, I, when I read this parable one thinks of the end of Romans 3 where Paul writes um, is God the God of Jews only is he not the God of Gentiles also yes of Gentiles also since God is one he will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith and that's what this story is telling us God receiving back the, those who are far away and those who are near <coughs> so they should both come and become his children, his sons in truth so that's a, that's a second context in which one can understand this story a, a, a wider context the story of the, the, the spread of the gospel to Gentiles as the New Testament develops well now as I said, I, I've suggested we can look at the parable in terms of Jesus' own time and what was happening in, in, in his own life and his ministry. I've suggested that it can be read in terms of the later development of the spread of the gospel. Now, in doing that, that's all very well so far, but what, we, what we're doing is, as it were, keeping this story at arm's length. We're reading it in context other than our own and the ultimate context is one that um, makes it applicable to ourselves because the, the younger son when you, when you really think about it is in a way an image of humanity at large humanity at large right from the story of Adam has done what the 
younger son did. He, we, have cut loose from God. We receive one amazing gifts from him, gifts and abilities. And we exploit them, and we exploit his world and its riches. And we find ourselves collectively now pretty much in the condition of the younger son left with the husks in a situation of some desperation in terms of environment and resources and our ability to live together and all the rest of humanity is in <coughs> an extreme case because of that initial act of rebellion and its consequences on, upon our actions and our thinking. Well now if that's the case, um, who's the elder son? And I suppose the, the elder son in, a, in that, that context has to be those who are believers and that means us I read this um, um, parable a year or two ago in our Bible reading group and I was interested and, and somewhat surprised initially by the reaction of the people in the group some of them actually felt that the, the elder son had got quite a case really you know, it was unjust, wasn't it? Clearly unfair. You know, sympathising with his sense. And I, I dare say that when we read the parable, we have at least a pang of recognition for his 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 feelings. And are we not, in fact, um, prone to adopting his kind of stance? As a, as a community we've not been free of that tendency to disparage unbelievers and to attribute to them all the worst motives uh, and have we not been a bit too happy in our exclusiveness and willing to write off, condemn those who, who fail and use that, that unlovely expression, the world to mean everybody else but us and are we entirely free of slavishness are we entirely free of making rules and being legalistic in our thinking, in our approach to such practical issues as um, marriage we, and probably most ecclesias, have a, um, a constitution which used to have bound in with it the, quotes commandments of Christ. And that seems to me a very strange thing to do because it immediately makes us look like we're, as if we're a community who have rules, a rule book to be kept, as though we had a law. And... Is our service to God entirely, or has it entirely been free of that motivation of that, that comes with thinking of God as a lawgiver, that we our worship is, is tinged with fear? We have a tradition that you come to the breaking of bread to um, be wrapped over the knuckles by the